Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Pazanka and Scott Parkin. Your co host, Scott Parkin, in Berkeley, California. And as always, I'm joined by Bob Bazenko. That's right. Today I'm in Houston, Texas, and I'm really excited. This is actually as much uh, as I've anticipated the show in a long time. We are speaking with uh, Bev Boisseau. And Bev, and I'm sure a lot of people know your name already, was a longtime assistant, administrative assistant for Noam Chomsky, I believe about 25 years, right? At MIT. Yeah. Yeah. At MIT, she's written a lot about it. And recently, I think in 2023, was the publication date, I believe? Or, okay. Published Chomsky and Me. I don't, do you have a, a hard copy of the book, Scott? Yeah, there we go. I read it in an ebook by Chomsky and Me, which is a part memoir, but part, I think it's actually an amazing history, too, of Noam Chomsky and his meaning and significance. So we are so excited to have you here to talk about not just Noam, but you, you as well. So welcome to the Green Red uh, Podcast, Beth. Thank you. Just to get started, to give a little bit of background on you, why don't you tell us, because I think it's a, it's a funny story about how you ended up getting this position as Noam's assistant, what you may have known about him uh, a little bit before that, what your background was. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. I had been working at MIT, managing some graduate programs in economics and ocean engineering. And I thought, you know what? I really, I love working with the students. I want to get a master's degree in psych and really work with people every day. I decided I'm going to take an easier job. So I, I, I was immediately offered this job working for Noam Chomsky. I knew who he was. I didn't know a lot. I thought he was like Ralph Nader. I said, what do I have? But the interview with Morris, his colleague, I, I never met Noam until at my third day of work or something. So my interview with Morris was very strange because he kept saying some things that were a little scary, journalists and the rest of it. So I thought, no big deal. I'm going to be here for three years and then I'll go off and do my psych. I can do anything for three years. So I said yes to the job, despite some little cautionary lights that were going <laughs> off in my head. <laughs> and once you got there, you were thrown right into it, right into the deep end. And, you know, what? so what was like your kind of first impressions, those first few months? Were you like just going nuts at the, the level of activity that you had? Um, yeah, I had, honestly, I thought, like I said, it was supposed to be an easier job. And I thought, <laughs> what is happening here? It was like the Wizard of Oz. It was like awe. <laughs> It was a whole new world. I had worked at MIT, but this place was different. This place was, first of all, the furniture. It, it was like Fred Flintstone days. It was very <laughs> old. Uh, and we were in the Building 20, the old decrepit Building 20. Uh, and no one liked it there because he said that's where they keep all of their troublemaking professors, the rabble rousers. So building 20 was wonderful. I, I loved it. And we were there for a number of years before we had to move out temporarily. Um, but it was an interesting place. Uh, I had a sense of humor. I thought, who is this guy? He's completely opposite from me. He's Jewish. I'm an ex-Catholic. He's from this very learned academic family, rabble rousers there. And I was just from a blue collar family. And I thought, how is this going to go? And the first time I tried to joke with him was about the Unabomber. And that didn't go over very so I told him when he said, be careful of packages that come in. And I thought, we'll just give them a little shake. He said, no. <laughs> Did he really have a, a, a nutcase file? You discovered? Yeah, I have. I hate to say that for sure. But yes, it was something called nutcase. I was very happy that I wasn't in it because we had approached him. I have this weird habit of, I have a gift of talking backwards fluently. Yeah. Don't ask me what I do with it. But I we're, we're, we're going to ask you about that at the end. I'm going to put you on the spot. So. There were uh, so there was a nutcase file and I made sure that I wasn't in it because we had approached him. A TV news <laughs> show had approached him six months before asking him to interview me yeah. uh, about talking backwards. And I, I don't think they ever heard back. Yeah. And I know Scott has a bunch, too. But that one one thing, what amazes me, and I used to say this, I remember, because I started communicating with him probably around that time when you came on in the early 90s. And I talked to other people, including I had a colleague who was at MIT. And he said one time over break, I guess the post office was closed and he was looking for something. He went in and there were like, this is the old days with regular mail. And there were six bags of mail and five were just for no. And so I can just imagine like how many emails a day and how many letters were you getting and how did you cope with all of it? 
Uh, that's right, because this was before cell phones, before yeah. uh, texting was just happening. It was a very basic. He probably got six or seven, maybe 10 texts a day, as wow. opposed to when I left in 17, when I retired, he moved. I think we were getting probably 800 a day. That's um, just text. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Emails. Emails. Okay. So email but still, was, whoa. Email. We didn't know. I, I meant to say email. Yeah. Yeah, um, but still. So yeah, lots of email. That's... Lots of email. So yeah, he, and he answered everyone. So we used to have probably a pile this thick at the end of the day of letters that he'd write himself. And then he'd send them to us, me, my assistant, to print out. And he'd sit and sign, sign. There was nobody, almost nobody, he didn't respond to. You can ask I heard that before. And I was going to ask you that because I just didn't believe it when I heard it. No one has that kind of time, right? I remember the first letter I ever got from him. I, I was on a research trip and I came on this big pile of mail and I'm going through it and I see this thing that says MIT Department of Philosophy or I forget what it was. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking like, there's no way it could be. If I'm shaking as I open it, thinking there's no way it could be. And it was from Noel. I was just like, oh my God, like I, yeah. I mean something in the world. Yeah. yeah, there was once in a while when once in a while somebody would write and they were way off the wall. And if they yeah. kept writing and they had good intentions about changing the world, just their way was a little bit yeah. strange. Yeah. He would probably answer every five messages from them if they were insistent. And then after a while, I'd say, Noam, do you want, want to keep doing this? And in a very blue moon, he, my dog worked with us for about yeah. Cat, 13 right? years. And he'd say, do you want to pass? Her name was Roxy. He'd say, yeah. do you want to pass this one on to Roxy? Maybe Roxy. she can reply. <laughs> <laughs> but he, didn't he also call the dog cat? Yes, he did. He <laughs> thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Maybe he just didn't see her. He wasn't paying <laughs> And besides this large amount of mail and an email that he got, one of the things I note in the book is that it's days of interviews and people coming to visit and things like that. What what was it? Were there typical days with him in the office or what was a typical yeah. day like? Yeah. So on Mondays, we usually caught up by email. We did a lot of our corresponding on the computer back and forth. So on Mondays, that's what we did. He prepared his talks and whatever. I sent him email constantly. My assistant sent him email constantly. And then on Tuesday, he came in for meetings and continued to send him emails on those days. And then on Wednesday, he again was home. Thursdays, he came in for class, but he'd come in and meet with people before class. And again, the emails were going back to his house. And then on, and he didn't have a computer in the office until many years later. Uh, and then on Friday, he came in again for his usual cruise and interviews with students. Yeah. Friday was a, a full day. Tuesday was a full day. Thursday was a half a day. But he was working till four o'clock in the morning every day. Sure. I can do this. He slept about, I would say, five hours a night at the very most. Wow. The very most. I know there are times because I'm at two hours when he was at MIT, I was two hours behind him. And there are times like late at night, I do a lot of my emails. So I would write assuming that maybe the next day or a day after. And then 3 a.m. his time, I'd get a response. And I was just like, I think one time I was like, you sleep. He once called, he called one of the librarians at 1 a.m. and oh, answered geez. his questions because he couldn't get on the system. And at the end, it was about 1.30. And he said, she said to Noam, do you know what time it is? <laughs> he said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> There's a, you have a chapter on Howard Zinn and the passing of Howard Zinn. And you talk about the the wobbly spirit, which Howard Zen brings up. And I could you talk a little bit about how that was that it, it, it comes across in the book as very much a learning moment for you. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about that a little bit. Tell me what you mean by wobbly spirit, because there are a lot of ways I can look at that statement. I believe you. I think it's like a, a reference to how there was there was this movement of folks who were organizing miners and other day laborers and things like that. Okay. okay. All then, about the yeah, yeah. About IWW. And there was like an IWW song, I think that was sung at Howard Zinn's funeral and, and things yeah. like that. And then you also included an email exchange with Gnome about when he went to visit miners in South America and how oh, that, yes. and, and about. It was. Yeah. All of that was so touching. And at, at Howard's uh, funeral, right. There was a gentleman who sang, the Joe Hill song, mm -hmm. I'm not dead, I'll never die, said he. And we were all in tears. Because I think at the base of Gnome's work and Howard's was the working person. 
um, always. That was always what came first. I don't care if there was a head of state or a president of something in our office. If somebody came in and somebody wanted an appointment, he would shorten that person give it to a working person, to a student, to, to the little guy, right? Right. Um, so there was, yeah, there was a lot of compassion for them, a lot of energy put into that world of a hardworking people who were wrongly jailed, same kind of category. Why are we jailed? Because big corporations are when other people should be in jail. And no one was always walking around saying the wrong people are in jail. And so he had a lot of, a lot of compassion for those people. And so did Howard. And Howard was also a playwright. And I believe that he, some of his plays touched on this as well. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm sure a million examples will come to me later, but right now I'm not getting any more. And in, and in the chapter, you talk about how that was a sort of where you began to really learn more about the history and the politics associated. There's the wobbly spirit, but in, in many ways, it's a, a yes. bigger picture related to left politics in, in the U.S. and the world. Exactly. And and the other thing you just touched upon was that I always thought it was about everybody else. The, the songs Joan Baez sang about people trying to make a living and being persecuted and, and all of the, the working people and what what they suffered through. And when I went to Howard's funeral, it dawned on me really in a burst, like a bright light coming from above, as they say, that, wait a minute, this is about me, us. This is about us right here. It's about my family. It's about the, the times now. My father was a working person. In fact, that's a whole other tangent, but you, you could at that time buy a house, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what, you didn't have to have a college degree. My father bought a house and he was a, a salesman. He was a good one. But he was a salesman. And uh, it dawned on me that I started crying for my father, who had passed away by then, about how hard he worked to make sure that his family had a home. You can't do that. I don't care if you're making $150,000 these days, at least in these parts, you can't buy a house for that. So I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but there are so many tangential thoughts to sure. every single thing right. uh, that happened in that office. I, I never stop. Right. I never stop thinking about it all. Well, we're, we're definitely big on the tangents here, so keep going off on tangents. Excellent. Um, Nome was larger than life for a long time. And I think people didn't understand just, he's a human, he's a guy, and he's got a sense of humor, and he had all these other things, and he just gave so much of his time up. I mean, do you want to just talk a little bit about just his commitment? Because like you said, he was just on the go constantly. He, he could have been, you know, he could have just written books and done nothing else because yeah. he had could have done any of that, but he didn't. Yeah. He, he answered driven. every email, which is still amazing to me because yeah. like I, when I get crazy emails, I just delete them. So <laughs> I got some pretty funny uh, <laughs> reactions from people when he did write. And there were a lot of words I can't say on this show. But they were like, <laughs> Are you kidding me? He wrote back to me. Yeah, yeah. But your original question was about how he did it, uh, why he did it, the fact yeah, that just, he did it. Just a little, just how he gave up his time and he was just, and he <laughs> like, he didn't give up his time. This was what he did. And and yeah. like I said in the book, it was almost as if he lived here. He lived in those places. If you walked into his kitchen at home, not one cabinet was closed. He didn't know <laughs> the simple things. I had to almost call him down. Just like when he went in for a meeting, I had to almost say, okay, no, let's reel you in. You need to be <laughs> here. And, and you could see his mind joining him in his body. Yeah. Um, whether yeah. it was for an interview, he was just, that's who he was. I don't think he would have continued to live without that. And and of course, every June, when he had to leave the office and go, of course, he worked still on the Cape. He had a little dungeon office in the basement and he would continue to work there. And once in a while, his family would drag him out, go on a boat, go do some gardening. So he tried to find some balance that way. Yeah. So he just was driven. He couldn't not do it. And in fact, I think... Well, no, along those like you said that there were times when like he forgot to eat and didn't have food in the house. And... <laughs> he, he forgot to eat. To make it easy, he only, I sometimes went shopping, especially after Carol died. And uh, I'm sure she tried to feed him before, but I'd say, look, I'm going to the store. I'll pick you up a few things. I'll bring them back at lunchtime and you can take them home. Or I'd go to his house with food and he only ate white things. So that was the way to make it. It made it very easy for me in the store. Okay, hummus, bread, whatever, just white things. So cottage cheese, maybe yeah. some celery, a little green in there. 
a tomatoes. It got to the point where I saw him eating this awful big sticky bun. And I said, what is that? And he said, breakfast. <laughs> My partner and I started cooking for him extra at yeah, night. Yeah. We'd bring him in on Tuesdays and Fridays. I'd bring him food, whether he could eat it then or take it home. Yeah. yeah. And, and did he really try to convince you that there was protein in scotch? Absolutely. And water. <laughs> there was, and there was water in scotch. I'd say, are you drinking water? Because he would get dehydrated, you know, yeah. as we all do after a certain yeah. age. And remember, he was 70, no, 66 when I started working for him. Yeah. And, uh, he was 88 or something, 64 and 88. Yeah, he was 88 when he le- when I stopped working. I thought he's going to retire any time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, he thought there was... I said, are you drinking water? I'd write him and say, are you drinking water? And he'd say, yeah, I put some in my scotch. That's <laughs> that counts, right? <laughs> yeah, I think you said coffee. He would also saw coffee as protein as well. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, this is just a side light. But the first time I ever met him, I went to a talk and we had corresponded. And he, I introduced myself and he said, do you want to get breakfast tomorrow? So I was on cloud nine. And I remember like he ordered eggs. And then I just, I couldn't get over them. Noam Chomsky eats eggs. Like he's mortal, like the rest of us. Was it eggs or egg? It may have been an egg, but it just, but it may have been, but yeah, but I still couldn't believe it. I just thought he like existed on oxygen and floated in the heavens or something. So. Yeah, he somewhat did. But I remember the United Ju- for Justice with Peace group, I think in Arlington here, because there were a million of them, yeah. I asked him to submit a recipe for their book, their recipe book. And it was a scrambled egg. Two of, <laughs> if there are two of you, make two eggs. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> there might have been a piece of toast involved. I, I think he had toast that day too, but I was just mesmerized by the fact that he's a human. He eats eggs. You know? so I was thinking of writing yeah. a story called No Chomsky Eats Eggs. So. <laughs> He'd probably tell you what came first, the chicken or the yeah, egg. Yeah, right. He would know if anybody would, right? If anybody would know, it would have been him. So. I'm sorry, Scott. I cut you off. Oh, I thought I cut you off there. You didn't cut me off. Um, oh. one, of, one of my favorite pictures, and you, there's some great photos in here too, is the one of, of No with the Sufi wearing like the hat and the shawl. And I assume he probably did a lot of that. Now, on one hand, he doesn't look uncomfortable doing it. Did you have a lot of people come in who really embraced him in that way? Yeah, it's funny you should say that because I am uh, I just finished a slideshow that I think I may make into a book for little yeah. kids like the Ruth Bader Ginsburg one. Here's how you can know about Chomsky. Um, but yeah, he was all such a good sport. And in fact, I talked about that in a slideshow about how People sent him things and said, okay, this is the name of our, can I have a picture of you doing this for our organization? Or this is the address and he'd have a piece of paper. So he did this a lot. The guy who made gnomes out of, made zin gnomes and gnome gnomes and garden gnomes. He'd hold those up and I'd take his picture. Somebody gave him a big big photo of himself and he had to pose with it. And that, that went on probably every day. Oh, really? Am I... Yeah, you're good. Am I good? Okay. We can fix that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> one one thing there's a you and he even blurbs your book, Michel Gondry, and he made a he made an animated film about Gnome is the tall man, is the man who is ha- tall happy. And I'm wondering man if you could tall. talk about that a, a bit. That was fabulous. And the idea is that is the man who is tall happy. Take out the is, it's the linguistic thing, and you put the is. The man who is tall is happy. How it, that one word change changes the whole sentence. So Michel is a character. He's done some really interesting movies, right? The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and the rest. He is just one of my favorite characters. Uh, and he decided he was going to do this animated movie of Gnome's life. And he came in with his eight millimeter camera and we had his film in the freezer for when he came back from Paris four or five months later. And he interviewed Gnome again. And then he went home and he made all of the different, what do you call them? Anyway, I can't, the, the word just flew out of my mind, my head, but he drew everything up. Okay. And uh, it was just wonderful. The movie, I think for those of us, especially who are visual learners, to watch this, this documentary, just to see, okay, Noam's talking about a tree growing and you can see the tree growing. And if you cut a limb off the tree and you plant it, is it the same tree? So he was proving some point. And he used my dog, Roxy, to demonstrate one of the, something in, in linguistics. What was it? I just had to, again, it flew out of my head. I think it's too hot in here too. But he used her to uh, illustrate a couple of things. 
and we run in at the end. And Noam was just such a good sport about it. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. And it was just after his first wife, Carol, had died. And so there was some touching thing, uh, a couple of touching scenes in there about them riding bikes together, things that they did. So the whole thing was just when Michelle came back after a number of months, we'd all sit around like kids and watch what he had done on the screen. And it was one of the upbeat things because we certainly saw a lot of dark things in that office. So to have Michelle come back and uh, and just be so playful was so needed. Yeah. Perked us all up. Yeah. I think that's a part of him, too, that's it's really important to get out there because we see him as almost like a machine. He's just so brilliant. And when he did have that, I didn't know. I try not to. I don't want to pretend I'm bragging. I knew him now, like, like thousands of others. I, I had contact with him. But I noticed that he could just be like a regular guy. And it made me feel at ease. And when you when we began, you said you were from a, a blue collar background. And so was I. And I think he appreciated people like that okay. rather than all the kind of stuffy Ivy Leaguers who we all run into so often. Yeah, um, he did, he did. it's absolutely true. You know, I, yeah, I remember telling him, you know, I come from Sicilian peasants. He said, given the way the world is, I'd much rather be hanging out with Sicilian peasants. It was really cute. You, you ran into not just filmmakers, but a lot of kind of well-known people. And they, they were there to see no, but they also entered your life. And you got to use this for cred within the family with your son. People like Tom Morello and, and Pearl Jam and many others. If you want to yeah. just talk to that, that must yeah. have been a kick, right? That must have been a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. yeah. And the Rocha there, the guy. Had Zach De La Rocha, his, yeah. Zach De La Rocha, he was fabulous. Yeah, he and I used it. I used this. My son, when you have a teenage son or whoever he was then, maybe he was in his early 20s, you want to be a cool parent, right? No matter yeah. what age you're, right? Yeah. So he, when Zach was coming, he said, Can I come in and interview Noam? And I thought, My son loves him. So I'd go in and say to Noam, You're going to interview with Zach <laughs> Dillard, wonderful band. And I talked to him as if he didn't understand any of this. And at one point I brought up bad religion or something because I was talking to Greg Graffin at the time as well. And he said, and Noam said, I believe there's monographs that they interviewed me for. So there's one group that had some some ongoing newsletter thing that Noam had written for it. So he sometimes I think he plays dumb about that stuff. <laughs> he knew that he knew yeah. a lot about these bands. Chumbawamba has something yeah. on them. So there were quite a few. Yeah. But when Zach came and my son got to meet him afterwards and it was just the most fun thing. And and I miss that. Yeah. I miss those fun things. And uh, Tom Morello adopted you as, as his Tom mom. Morello, he called me mom for a couple of weeks. Too bad I can't find his, his, uh, if you have his email, send it to me. I want to send him the book. He never <laughs> responds to us. We've emailed him. Yeah. yeah I, my son thinks he can find him. So I'll let you know if I do. Come yeah. on, Tom, are you out there somewhere? <laughs> yeah, we'd Tom love to have him on too, yeah. He's very <laughs> political, Tom. His pa- his father, I think, was political. His mother, but he comes from a really honest background. He's a wonderful yeah. guy. And this was going to be his first interview. He wanted to interview Noam and post it on NPR. And yeah. he did. It. And he was nervous. And I loved that. It's all yeah. right, Tom. I know you're famous and all that, but just calm down. <laughs> I think one of Noam's most famous interviews was with Ali G., which oh, you want to just kind of yeah. point to that because I I, yeah. I realized I know the way all EG operates, but I got a sense that no one kind of knew he was and he was in on it too. I mean, we did not. I don't know how. Oh, and really? this is this is something I have I spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. In fact, he had gave an interview years later at MIT, and I called him and said, "Who's his agent? I need to find something out. I need to find out how he got in." Yeah. Did he, he had to lie to us, of yeah. course. It, it, we always take people at face value. Unfortunately, that's backfired a few t- times. This was one <laughs> of those times. And Ali G came in. Honestly, was I in the bathroom? Was I walking the dog? I don't remember him coming in a gold suit. <laughs> but I do remember Noam coming out afterwards saying, Bev, which is how he started every single sentence to me. Bev, no more men in gold suits. <laughs> Ali G came in and it was so embarrassing for him, I would think. But Noam played it straight. I think yeah. despite Ali G's efforts to make Noam look foolish, I don't think he did. He did ask him, how many words does you know? <laughs> and what is some of them? And Noam said, we're using them right now. <laughs> oh, I wish I could talk to Ali G just for- I remember seeing that and just falling on the floor laughing. You know, this was really brilliant. Yeah, I've seen it about eight or ten times myself. <laughs> yeah, did did, did uh, Sasha Baron Cohen was Ali G, right? So yeah, 
Yes. Did, did, did they ever do a follow-up? Did they ever reach out back Ooh. after you again, or did they just disappear after that? I don't think they could have pulled that off twice. <laughs> uh, but who knows? Sally G, he's, he's Sasha Baron Cohen. He can yeah. pretty good at pulling things off. Yeah. yeah. But no, yeah. they never came back as far as I know. But wasn't it also true that, I think you alluded to it earlier, no one would actually have school kids from Boston come in and he would give them priority over a lot of these celebrities. Yeah. He loved it. Yeah. We'd rent the outside hall room in the student area and they'd all sit at the table. Sometimes they just sat in his office if they were happy. They'd sit on the floor, sit on the shelves yeah. and just ask him questions. And he just loved that. He loved that yeah. they were thinking. He, the thing Noam liked the most was not, hey, Noam, what should I do? It, the question he wanted to hear was, hey, Noam, we're doing this. What do you think? Yeah. This is, how, this is what we're thinking. We just want to know how you're, how you, what you think about what we're doing, not what should we do. So I that, know. yeah. When we had him, I know Scott <clears throat> was actually a, in, in grad school time. And so we had a get together with just the students who had helped organize it. And he did seem like at ease and really like he was enjoying that. There were some other people in Houston who I think made his life difficult, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I know. And our, and ours. I know. Yeah, but I know Scott and, and others, they still today talk about it. Whenever the pictures come out, they, it's just everyone's eyes light up, their face lights up. You know? I'm it, trying it, to remember that. When did that happen? 2002 in October. It was like, okay. yeah, the fall. Yeah. Maybe you can send me a little clip of that. I'd love to see. I, I can send you the speech. We have it up on the thing. Okay, great, great. But I'll yeah, it was, but it just, everybody lit up and he just looked different there when he was in that room than later that night when he spoke in front of 2,500 people. And you had long-winded questions and people like me introducing and making speeches that were probably longer than his. So Yeah, no, the younger, the better. He loved students, uh, no matter yeah. what age. But he also lit up around children. Yeah. Uh, he loved to tease them and make up stories. The story about putting a stick. The kids would go to bed if they had uh, company on the Cape. And they'd put, he'd put, they'd put sticks in the sand. He'd say, put some sticks in the sand. And then he, when they were asleep, he would replace the sticks with little limbs. So it looked like they had grown. Oh, tree. <laughs> and try to convince the children that the sticks had grown. No, they didn't. That's just <laughs> who did that. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> they were always playing tricks on his, on his grandchildren. One grandson, they had an argument about baseball and Noam tried to tell him that what was his name? Roy Halliday. Yeah. I think was this famous person. And his grandson kept saying, no, he's not. He's not. He <laughs> said, yep, he is. I even have a signed baseball by him. And so Noam had me buy a baseball. And I had to look up this guy's signature and forge it on the baseball. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to his grandson. You know, he I, he mentioned that a few times. He's, he was a baseball fan. He told me his first game he'd ever seen was in Yankee Stadium where Joe DiMaggio was playing. He was like sitting in the yeah. outfit behind Joe DiMaggio. Yeah, he was right there. He loved that. And and yeah. you wouldn't know, you wouldn't think of Noam as being a sports fanatic because he yeah. can't fit it in. This yeah. is why I yeah. asked him, yeah. how come you're not a big dog, animal advocate? And he said, because I can't fit it. Yeah. People, yeah. there's so many people I can't even. So people yeah. sometimes think how come he doesn't speak out about this or that animals or anything uh, yeah. or a lot of other things but he does he does he just can't you can't spread yourself that thin he was overwhelmed with the people part of it in the book you talk about laughing through tears which it, it, i think it's around the topic of how we acknowledge and deal with the absurdity and the grief of everything that's happening to us in the world or what's happening in the world and gnome is was deeply involved in lots of things going on in the world and writing on it and speaking on it and that sort of thing. How did he, how did he laugh through the tears? How did he deal with this sort of state of the, what's often the state of the world? It, it feels particularly bad now, but I, you I know, know. looking back on the seventies and eighties and nineties, just as bad. Yeah, I know. I know. It always feels worse now too, but I, I spent a lot of time. I'm not going to give myself a lot of credit here, but I'm going to say that he spent a lot of time thinking, why me? Why was I in that position? Why, what was it about my, did, did it make a difference that I was there rather than Joe Schmo or anyone else? And then I thought back about how many times we joked about things, although there's a second side to that as well. So I, I, I had a sense of humor. He knew I had done a little stand-up comedy. He knew that I was into humor. And so I think he played 
hit upon that. And I made him laugh a number of times. He'd send me something and it wouldn't make any sense. Or I, t- I thought I sent him something. And then I wrote him to say, oh, no, ignore what I just sent you. And then I realized I hadn't sent it. So I wrote him again and said, ignore what I wrote you about ignoring what came before. <laughs> we had this whole conversation. He said, can you ignore something if you've never? So we got into this whole fun gnome-ish conversation. <laughs> And he wrote back and said, it's things like this that brighten a gloomy day. And so I gave that some thought because there were so many times when I'd see him just looking, coming in the door, just looking sad, overwhelmed, just feeling the world. And I would do something. He would literally, and his face (laughs) would light up. And I thought if I could stop him from one day of pain, if I could stop him from a moment of pain, then then I didn't live in vain, not to quote something like the Bible, but um, <laughs> it felt good to make him laugh. And, and yeah. I think also my dog sneaked into his office during a very important filmed interview about Israel and Palestine. And I heard a clanging sound, which only could mean that she was looking for food in his trash can. Oh, and I thought, oh no. So I went in there and I crawled inside. I crawled in the office and I watched the dog again, Roxy, just clang at the thing. And I pulled her out and I shut the door and he came out afterwards and he said, Bev. And I said, oh, he's going to fire me. That's terrible. I can't believe my dog did that. This isn't great. And he looked at me and said, is there any more coffee? And I said, what? You're going to let me get away with that? Did you see what happened? He said, I heard some commotion, but he said, you know what? We need the comic relief around here. We need that comic relief. So I thought, okay. (laughs) Years ago, I had an email with a little quote from The Simpsons on it. It was a Homer saying, maybe Lisa has a point about America being the land of democracy. Maybe Adil has a point about the machinery of capitalism being war with the blood of workers. And I said that, but I had it like, it was an email with a question or something. He writes back really quickly and he says, did they really let Homer get away with saying that on TV? And he was laughing. You get a kick out of that. He didn't answer my question. He did later, of course. But he just was so tickled. And then I interviewed him last year for the masterclass thing. And we did like a section on, We it was great, like six hours. We did one of the sections on, on, on linguistics. We were talking about B.F. Skinner. And when we went to break, I said, on The Simpsons, the principal was named Principal Skinner after B.F. Skinner. And he was just like chuckling over that. He thought it was so funny. <laughs> I, I hadn't realized that, but it's funny. Everything that you're bringing up, it's making me very happy because of the the slideshow that I'm just putting together for these yeah. older people in a community where they, they all have to do a certain amount of credits of education. Yeah. And they're all in their 70s, 80s. And, uh, and I also put in The Simpson, there's a cartoon and it says there's a grinder pizza place and it's called Chomp Skis. Oh, and yeah. It shows Homer Simpson, and then you have Gnome holding his two briefcases. And yeah. I could, I could, my God, there's Gnome. And people started yeah. sending it to us. It didn't say specifically that it was Gnome, but you could see that it was Gnome. It was hysterical. Yeah. Was well, the, the, Onion, the Onion did a piece on him one time. Like, Noam Chomsky just wants to have an easy day where he can eat his soup kind of thing. He was, he was actually on a, on a swing, a wooden swing, enjoying yeah. himself enjoying and it. not reading. Now, that's how I knew it was a lie. Yeah. I've not seen him without a piece of reading in his hand. Yes. <laughs> in the book, you have lots of great stories about Gnome, but I also know that on editing process that they probably cut things out. I'm wondering if there's anything that you had wanted in the book, but then had to cut because the editors had said this, you know, it has to be X amount of words or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm asked that question a lot. And I actually wrote down a bunch of answers, which I don't happen to have on me right now. But I can tell you, that one of the most wonderful th- things about working with him was the the older guys that worked with him. Louis Kampf, who started Resist with him. He was the founder of Resist. Re- do you know what that is? Resist Illegitimate yeah. Authority. And a bunch of other people, Wayne, just a, a lot of wonderful people that worked with him, Jay Kaiser. And they were just, I think they helped also keep his spirits up. Whenever they were in his office, they were laughing, they were joking, and they were connecting. And because he didn't hang out at home, he wasn't a party guy. So it was, I, I wanted to write all about them, but of course it wasn't their book. It, and most of them died except for Jay Kaiser and Noam. Uh, and that was very difficult for all of us. And in fact, after I retired, I would write Noam and say, I'm sorry about Hillary Putnam. I'm sorry to hear about Marcus Raskin. By the way, I think his son should run for president, but by the way, when Noam agreed, 
I think I would have written a lot more about those guys, about his pals at MIT. Yeah. You clearly had a, a strong relationship with him, but you, what you might actually be a little modest about. Do you want to talk a little more? Because it, he gets involved with your whole family. You travel with him. I think it, it, you were just an administrative assistant. There was a lot more to it. And I, that must have been amazing for you as well. But Yeah. Uh, again, you're being a little bit of a psychic here because that's the feedback I got on my slideshow. I'm downplaying the fact that he and I were very close. Yeah. Um, I remember we were in an uh, airport. <clears throat> we were in an airport uh, going to or coming back from Ireland, I think. And he spilled coffee on the table. And you could see him just looking so embarrassed. And he said, this is what happens when you hang out with an old man. And I could have burst into tears. I really could have. There are several things that have happened over the years with him and Morris. that I really could have just cried. <clears throat> And so to prove him wrong, Laura, my partner, a few minutes later, spilled her. We had a good laugh about that. <clears throat> and then later, Laura spilled a drink. I believe it was Laura. But they made up a whole joke about how when I left the table, I did it. And the, the drink, I did it with my coat and my the drink was spinning. And it wasn't until I went over there to pay the bill that the drink fell. So it wasn't <laughs> either of them. You know? But also, I think more seriously... When Carol passed away, I he, I, I won't get into anything personal here with him because he was, of course, heartbroken. He had a lot of regrets. He had a lot of just the sadnesses that you have when you lose somebody. And I'd look at, the, he gave me a, he said, all the pictures that we have, could you cut me out and just frame Carol? I want her around. So I did that. And when he doubted that he was a home enough, did I have too much to do in my work? Was I too busy? I'd say, look at her. You even told, told me, Noam, that she was supremely happy. Look at her. How can you be supremely happy if you're not happy at home? And she was fulfilled. And you were a great person, always a wonderful family man. So I yeah. found myself holding him up there and some other times too. What, what was it like traveling? with him abroad like you went to the vatican right we went to the well, vatican was, and of yeah. course every time we traveled with him at the vatican any catholic college he would talk about abortion he would talk about divorce he would just throw it in their faces and he would at breakfast that morning no matter what he was planning to talk about he would we didn't know this he's very sneaky but he'd run it by laura and me and start talking about something and see how we reacted and I don't know if that affected what he'd say later or informed it in any way, but he, and he was great. He was fun. In fact, after my mother died, we traveled with him and I was very afraid to go. I was just so emotional. And we were going to Cork, which is where her grandmother, who she grew up with, had been born. And I was very nervous about going, but we went and Noam took me on a pub crawl and he was just so supportive. And at the end of it, <laughs> Laura and I wrote a, a limerick from he was they made him fly first class. and He was older. He wasn't he couldn't get in those little seats. And we sent it with the, the flight attendant to the front of the plane, the little limerick we wrote about him. And he came back waving it. We have to save this. We have to save this. Yeah. So traveling with him was just one. We were talking to these these priests, these high priests who worked for the the Vatican where we were staying and and Noam was just <laughs> they pulled some fruit over and Noam said they said it's ripe and Noam said the fruit's not ripe what is it then and it was just like all these wordplay things and he made me talk about the dog and he said yeah sometimes we have Roxy answer my emails when they asked him how many emails okay. he had and I thought he's had he could talk about anything in the world with these guys and he's talking about my dog answering emails but he that playful side of him, I believe, was important for him. Yeah. I think it probably kept him nourished. I can't imagine if he didn't play with the children and with me and my sense of humor. And I also realized years later that his joining in to my humor was a way for him to soften everything that I was seeing every day. Kids with their limbs blown off or whatever horror I was looking at because I intercepted all of his mail. I think yeah. he was trying to make sure that I, to save my sanity. Yeah. How, how did you deal with the kind of 
more negative or nasty letters of the attacks? Were you afraid? Were you angry? Was it just stressful? Or Yeah, I do talk about that in the book as well. Yeah. I One day I did just had enough of it. I wanted to write back and say, leave him alone. You have I have no idea. You're, you're so off the mark. This guy is completely real. And so I walked into his office and I said, no, how do you deal with these angry, horrible people that write you? And he said, do you get mad at a hurricane? And I said, what? <laughs> do you get mad at a hurricane? And I said, I get upset if there's a hurricane. If I, What do you mean? And so he sent me away and, and I came back again. And I, I asked him a different way because I try to trick him. Maybe he won't realize I'm asking the same. Of course, he always knew what I was doing. But he said, people are hurricanes. And he said, people are hurricanes. It's just like a weather. So I, I went for weeks wondering what he meant. By that. And finally, I wrote him a third way. And he came back with, you can't control this stuff. You can't control these people. You can't change them. You can't change the weather. You just have to ride out. And just like people in their anger. One person did send a very nasty virus. It was a nasty thing. Mm. And we had to close down our system for half a day mm. just to clean it out. It was terrible. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this involved you or it probably did, but a, a package came in once and I guess they called the MIT police and stuff. And it was like pa some soup for Passover or something like that, or for a Seder. Was that, were you or not? Was that, you got it? Or? Are you talking about two different things? Maybe. Oh, maybe the, the matzo box that came in. Was That's one it. Yeah. yeah. And plus there was during the time of the Unabomber, uh, a big wrapped up in duct tape uh, piece of luggage came in. And the woman, so I'll tell you that one. The woman came in from headquarters and said, don't anyone touch this. It's for Noam Chomsky. I'm sure there's something wrong with it. And she kicked it across the room for some <laughs> reason. And we were all, What? So they called the police, they came in, they took it away. It was just a hoax. But the other one was, <laughs> Milm was away for a few days in a box of the, I'm sorry, I'm not Jewish, it's matzo crack, matzo. I say yeah. matzo, which is absolutely not what it is, bread or whatever. Yeah. They came in and it said six, and it said watched from the time of planting. So I thought, wow, these must be sacred. But I was hungry. So I opened <laughs> the box, and he wasn't around, and I... <laughs> I ate one. And the next day, I was hungry again. And they were so <laughs> good, really, for a horrible thing. They were very plain, but they it was calling to me. I got it down, the six down to two and a half. And I kept changing the number of how many <laughs> things were actually in this box. And when he came in, I, I told him, I'm sorry, this is what I did. I, I apologize. I hope I didn't do anything bad. And he said, wow, watch time of planting. And he went. And just stood there like that. The sense of humor was fun. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he forgave me for eating those. <laughs> one one question I have, which is like, what do you see as his? What do you see as his legacy? It's he's this. I don't want to call him larger than life, but it, he's the best with the arguably the most important intellectual living today, and he's like a one of the all time best selling living authors of the moment. And I'm, yeah. I'm wondering from your perspective where you worked with him so closely for so long and knew him so well, what do you see as some of the uh, important part of his legacy? I don't think he would want any of that to be it. I think he would want the truth to be always look for the truth, always find the truth. Compassion for other human beings was always at the forefront of anything he did. And it affected everything he did, everything he said. Generosity toward others. Uh, Miss America, we always made fun of her because at the end, when we asked her what she wanted, she always said, and I want world peace, but that's what he wants. Yeah. He wants world peace and he wants it for the little guy. He wants it for the, he wants it for all of us. And it doesn't matter what country he wants everyone to not be bombed, to not be living in fear, to not have any kinds of terror in their lives. And I don't know how he's feeling right now about everything that's going on. He's not in the public eye at the moment, but certainly there are a million interviews that will address yeah. everything that's going on now. So it's not like his voice isn't out there. Yeah, um, I think but, it's also telling, I've been listening to a lot of, of, of podcasts and interviews about the Gaza 
and especially Norman Finkelstein, but also Rashid Khalidi, all these people are saying, Noam's not around right now talking about this, so it's up to us to yeah. do it. And Finkelstein often says, it's like, he asks himself, okay, what would Chomsky say about this? WWCD. I've, yeah. been, I've been answering a lot of questions on Reddit because yeah. I had done an AMA some time back. Yeah. And I think he would just tell people, just be active. You have to do something. I once had my granddaughter in my office and she asked him, what good did the to the walks? It was the women's the women's the, the march on the yeah. women, and she said, "Why do we march? What does it do?" And he said, "Because it brings attention to the, yeah. the cause." He said, "And you got to keep trying. Never forget him doing that because he's always doing that. When he meant something, his fist went up. He said, <laughs> you keep trying. You can't stop trying." And I think that's something that he would say to activists who, by the way. Are, can be depressed, can be overwhelmed by their work. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, I wrote my blog. But once I started seeing that activists were reading and saying, wait a minute, Noam Chomsky has a boat? Maybe I don't have to burn out. And so yeah. I think it was important to show, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Nobody asked me a question, but here I go. Um, no, it's I fine. It's, yeah. yeah, it's important. Important um, for people to know that he was a human being. He wasn't yeah. super. He eats, he eats eggs or eats an egg. He eats egg. Yeah. He eats egg. <laughs> he eats egg. <laughs> I remember he, but like now I had that impression though. Like I said, I thought he was this like deity almost. When like, I'm sure yeah. I embarrassed him when I like when I first met him, I was gushing. He wrote me a letter of recommendation, and he kept saying, "This is probably going to hurt you." And I was like, "I don't care. I I want you to do it." And it was funny because like, after that, he said, if you need any more uh, poison pen recommendations, just let me know. So he wanted to help, but he also understood it was, but he talked about, like, he remember telling me he took his um, grandson, I think, to the garden to see the Celtics garden. And, but yeah, I think that was important for me because it is easy to burn out and think, oh, I can never be like that. And you can't be like him, but still yeah. you can operate in those waters. And, and That's I, think right. that I is... probably bought the tickets to the Celtics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But, uh, no, he has to. He had to. He did go out on the boat. He did garden. He yeah. did do those things. But he only slept four or five hours. Yeah. Even when he watched, I think it was I Give Genie with the kids. He was watching little shows like that once in a while as a family when the girls were little. Yeah. I don't know if Harry was around yet, but he would be watching TV with them, but he'd be going like this. And they'd say, are you watching or are you writing a paper or are you writing a letter? And he'd say, no, I'm just holding my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a, a, before we go, I want to ask you about your linguistic ability to speak backwards, but I don't know if Scott has any anything to. I, I, had, I had a second question, but I think that it was just answered right there. Okay. <laughs> So I, I don't mean to like, if you're embarrassed, I, I, I'm sorry, but do you want to talk? Because I think it's fascinating. Like the, to, what, you talk backwards, like you, you put the letters in the opposite sequence. No, it's as if you play the sentence backwards and you probably can do this now after yeah. I'm done. So I hope I don't screw it up. But you give me a sentence and I would play it as if it were being recorded backwards. So if I say something backwards, you should be able to record it forward and get a pretty accurate I once did this with my brother, who was uh, an MIT student, a physicist, and he had a little program that could play it backwards. And he showed me this jar of pills and it said, do not, well, whatever it said, I said it backwards and it came, it sounds like I'm from Mars, but it's fun. But if you want to give me a sentence, I'll try to say it back backwards for you. Okay. Um, just, I'm Bev and I was Noam's assistant and I just wrote a book, something like that. All right. So I'll say... I'm Bev Stoll. I was Gnome's assistant, and I've just written a book. I said I'm Bev. I didn't say Bev Stoll. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that was that's what that's it's just it's just in your brain. From you, you but no, you, you're proving him right about language being organic, right? So I was a very bored kid. I don't know yeah. if I was not practice it's something it's not even something it's just something intuitive it's a strange that's what I mean no I think I think his point about the you know the, the you know the nature of linguistics it was fate yeah, that you two it was fate that brought you together right <laughs> maybe I'd like to think so you know, yeah the Sufi, the Sufi thought I would never have regrets the Sufi who came into my office 20 years yeah. after said you won't have any regrets and I don't have yeah. any regrets it was a wild and wonderful ride and I'm I feel so fortunate that I was somehow pushed into this so i don't know how it happened but i'm really happy that it did yeah i don't know if scott has anything else but you can tell us also about the book and 
how to get it and what you're working on now, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm skiing. Oh, me? Want me to say Yeah, something? yeah. Just talk a little yeah. bit about it. If you get the book, if they want to follow you and what else you're doing, you know, and promote yourself a little bit. You know. Yeah, I wish I'm just finally putting together a website, but you can find me on Instagram, Chomsky and me. You can yeah. find me on Facebook, Chomsky and me. Or you can get in touch with me there. I'll be happy to talk to people. I yeah. text people and email people all the time. So yeah, the book is in a lot of bookstores. It turns out if you go to a bookstore and it's not there, you have to ask for it. Yeah, Chomsky and me. And let's see, I'm doing a lot, a lot of events around, which I do post on a blog, which is bevstoll.blogspot.com, I think. And we'll uh, put it in the show. We'll put it in the show we'll notes the too. Show notes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. I already put, and I already put, I already actually have it in the list to put in the show notes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And we have a fairly extensive Chomsky playlist for our podcast because he's been a guest several times. And so we'll certainly delightfully add this to it, which I'm looking forward to. Thank you. And it was just, like I said, I spoke to you for the first time, probably 25 years ago, I don't know, 20 years ago. And and your name, I think so many of us know your name. So it's really cool to be able to see that you're a gnome, actually, a real person, not just this. You are yeah, kind of a yeah. larger than life figure in your own way. And yeah, uh, I go I by know, Bev. Everyone says Bev Stoll. I know that name. And so yeah, I'm yeah. afraid of her. I'm afraid of <laughs> Bev Stoll. What? <laughs> <laughs> I know when he came out, you, the last time I talked to you before he came out, I, I don't know if he wasn't, if he'd had a cold or something, but you, maybe Carol had told you to, to tell him not to take questions or something like that. And yeah, I remember after the, after, Carol. yeah, but I think you were, I think you even said Carol said, and I, I went up to him after it was, after he spoke and I said, Carol and Bev said that you need to take it easy and you shouldn't take questions. He just like, shushed me away. Oh, you know? <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. If you want me on again, I'll tell you how many times Noam pretended that he was going to follow the rules and how many times <laughs> he didn't. Like, <laughs> yeah. So that's a longer story, but yeah, that's Noam. Yeah. That's yeah. We're, you're welcome back anytime. And we, this is one of our favorite things. And I just, it's delightful. And he's so important to so many of us. And you were just that there and you were, you helped make this all possible too. You were a big factor in making this all possible. So we're really looking forward to talking with you. And this has been really delightful. Yeah. So I'd love to come back. I'd love to come back and talk about him some more. I, I'll tell you what, maybe, maybe um, we can send you a, a green and red hat. You can wear it, promote us a little bit. Okay. I don't look good in hats. It's in the book. But yes, I will wear that. I will yeah, wear we, uh, that. I'm just. I'm going to do a little bit of promo just uh, briefly. But uh, if any of you out there are interested, because look at the great shows we have on Bev Stoll. This is fantastic. But for $25, <laughs> you can get your inner and hat. For $35, you can get a copy of my first book, which actually no mentioned when he was interviewed a couple times after it came out. He said, there's a new book out by this guy. And so that was a big kick. But $25 for the hat, $35 for the book. And help us continue to have amazing guests like Bev on. So. <laughs> yep. Thank and, you. I hope, I hope you both had fun. A little bit. Oh, of fun. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And folks uh, out there in the audience, if you like what you're hearing, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to us on an audio platform, give us a rate and review as it helps us with the algorithms. And if you really like us, go to greenredpodcast.org and hit the support button or become a patron at patreon.com backslash green red podcast and to get a hat or a book email us at greenredpodcast at gmail.com and we'll get right back to you we've already we've been selling hats so please check them out and get a hat or a book and bev it's been really great talking with you today you um, guys are doing great stuff thank you so much for oh, me, thank you. everybody all of your viewers all of your subscribers really good stuff I appreciate being on on your show yeah and everyone else out there, misbehave. And we'll talk to you again soon.